Welcome to the Week in Italian Startup, where we discuss the latest highlights happening in the Italian tech and investment ecosystem. Jumping into the news of the week, starting from the biggest round of last week, uh, let's start from Betaglue, clinical stage targeted treatment radiotherapy company raising 8 million in a round led by Neva SGR with a participation from Lifty. Um, this is uh, again like um, a, a, a kind of a, a further validation that, uh, especially in medtech, uh, personalized treatment is really making waves and is, uh, investors are really looking closely into whatever is uh, personalization in the future of medicine. And uh, this is another great example. So uh, Italian-based company, uh, great investors also, including like Neva SGR from Intesa and Lifty. Uh, so definitely like two well-positioned investors. And uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the idea of the company is like a basically um, they are focusing on uh, the idea that a tumor, they have the unique molecular and genetic profile. And essentially the response to therapy depends on that. And by leveraging this kind of insight, then they're developing like therapy in this, uh, in this specific field. So uh, it's not the first uh, deal that we've seen maybe in the last 12 months about personalized treatment. So definitely there is like a pattern there which uh, has been forming and has been solid. What's, uh, what's your feel? I mean, we're not a med tech investor, but from the outside, it, it looks like there is a little bit of a pattern. So very interesting on this side. Yeah, well, as you said, Jack, I am no expert, so I have no idea. Uh, so I think the approach can be interesting, but uh, no idea at all. Um, what I wanted to what I wanted to consider was uh, to add some more um, color around the round that they raised. Uh, Betaglue, this is the second round uh, they raised. The first one recorded is a ten million. Uh, seen in 2022, um, uh, which I'm not sure, but uh, I believe it might be related uh, to the to the EIC, uh, EIC the European Innovation Council, um, which invested 10 million in the company in blended yeah, finance. Good point. So as you know, the European Commission has a um, sort of investment program. Um, dedicated to startups working in specific verticals and that are, that are hard to finance. So the market um, has difficulties in financing them because, you know, risk um, uh, too much deep tech, uh, stuff like that. So, and so they have this uh, investment program dedicated to these type of startups. Uh, there is 10 million in the, through that program and this 8 million on, on top. Uh, on Crashbase, I can also see another 10 million round from 2022, but it's not clear whether it is the same as the, as the EAC or not. I don't know whether you, you, you had or you have more uh, information. Yeah, I mean, uh, not specifically on that one. What definitely caught my eye was the idea of like uh, the blending finance solution that the EIC is, uh, is pushing. I don't think it's the, it's the first time, but and this is like part of like the official program, as you were mentioning. So, uh, I mean, good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say great because it's still like a debt kind of, uh, kind of tool, which is great uh, to give like access to capital, not as uh, maybe powerful of, as, as an equity investment probably, but uh, for like a European like uh, uh, institution, um, maybe willing to de risk their own position, that it, it definitely makes makes sense. It's like a venture. Well, it is at all effect venture debt, uh, if we will. So this is uh, this is what a little bit what they're doing. What is uh, what is your feel on the on the on this uh, debt uh, kind of uh, take? Well, I mean, it's check. It's it is finance. Uh, when you need to, to finance your company, you, ra you, you, you raise what you get and what's, what makes sense for you. I mean, it is debt, but it tends to be patient debt from an institution mm -hmm. that has, uh, has a central strategy to sustain startups that have a long-term uh, vision before being on the market with their products. So that's you know, the basic idea of the, of the instrument. So maybe it's even better than equity at this stage just because it's patient capital with little impact on your cap table if you are successful you will find ways to 
um, to refinance or to repay that back and still get uh, the upside of keeping your, your equity. So not good, not bad. It really depends at the end of the road whether it was you were successful or not in, in the living right. business. So, I mean, this is my thing. My, Interesting. My fault. Right, let's move on. Uh, Sibyl, treasury management startup announcing a 6.2 million round from Keen Venture Partner, Exor Ventures and a few other founders. So very interesting. Sibyl is basically um, a very sort of Italian tool, I would say. I would, it's, they focus on small and medium enterprise and they basically help them manage their cash flow uh, by aggregating data across like different like uh, you know bank accounts and in italy is kind of a challenge because not all banks especially regional bank are uh, as digitized as one might think and on top of that we have uh, the amazing agenzia delle entrate so the, <laughs> the tax collection institution which is starting to get digitized by their back uh, i think in the 90s in terms of platform which you know nothing against that is just that uh, you know good opportunity for people to aggregate data and make them easier to use so Sibyl is basically like pulling everything together in a way that uh, a small entrepreneur can actually work uh, efficiently by managing their cash flow so definitely a very good value proposition I would say and uh, it's a real problem in Italy for sure so that's uh, that's definitely something something extremely interesting and uh, what is interesting is that the company just launched 18 months ago and uh, they are already like moving really fast. So very, very good performance, I would say, like a little bit more than a year and they're raising like a good amount of, of uh, what is, can be considered like a Series A, like Italian uh, standard Series A maybe. Well, late, uh, early stage, uh, beginning Series A, I would say. Then Nika, you know, this, this, this value is like a volatile. We know that uh, just, uh, but it's definitely like a, a good, uh, a good result, I would say. Yeah. So I agree with you. Um, very nice result. Even more so as the lead investor is not an Italian fund. So the key venture partners, we've seen them recently because they, they invested in other, in other rounds in the last few weeks. Uh, they actually spent some time here in, uh, here in Italy recently. Uh, so we have this operator that's looking at the country, uh, quite, you know, looking quite below the radar. So with no big announcements, but uh, good point. it's Very interesting good point, to, yeah. see, to see someone who's just looking at the Italian market so closely and closing so many deals in, a, in just a few, just, just a short amount of time. Uh, so that's very good. So I agree with you. They were, they, they had a very good growth, uh, for, you know, being started less than two years ago. Um, and I fully agree with you, treasury management is a huge problem, probably everywhere. Um, I would dare to say that they started by copycatting Agicap, that's the, uh, one of the French posters, poster childs of the big um, boom in the French startup ecosystem from a couple of years ago. I haven't heard, heard of them recently, but still, that's the basic starting point for support for, for, for Sibyl. Um, so good, nice. This, well, I like the idea of having um, international investors coming to Italy. I don't know whether to call this a seed round or a Series A round. Maybe for, 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 for a Central European investor, this is a seed. For us, this is a Series A. It really depends on what, where, where they want to go with this money uh, and what's next for them. Yeah, I mean, the, the good insight you were mentioning is that, uh, yeah, Keen Venture Partner is really like a kind of a looking very close to Italy. And uh, I was checking their portfolio. They're an investor in Fisco Zen as well. So, I mean, they're going pretty into like Italian, pro, Italian native problems into deep tech. So, again, Fisco Zen is like a super Italian sort of digitization solution. So awesome job on their side to actually pin down something that is very very you know niche and narrow and national and going hard on this part so yeah I can, see, I can see a pattern there don't you so fisco then tax management civil treasury management what's next jet hr uh, hr management ah, interesting. What do we have very interesting here? so let's let's let's, let's see, see if it's gonna happen Let's see if it's gonna happen, Nick. That's a, that's a bet. Well, that's a bet for later on. 
Well, I, I guess, uh, I guess uh, finally investors locally and internationally are just, you know, looking at the market and say, okay, so there are big problems, even, even international, local, pro local problems that are being solved in Germany, in France, or in the UK. Let's see whether there's a local player with the same capability of solving the same problem and let's invest in the, in, in the, in the best player that you can see in that vertical. So that's a thesis over there, I would say. Good point. No, for I would sure. dare to say. Interesting. All right, let's talk about uh, our friends at uh, Unruly VC. Very interesting um, happenings there. So essentially, Unruly started a few years ago. Uh, Stefano Barnard is the lead in this project. They've been start. They've been investing like across geographies in uh, very disruptive companies across sectors. Uh, so the thesis is very unique. And uh, what they released last week was essentially. Uh, their full like fund structure, portfolio, investment tickets in a very, very detailed way. And by doing this, kind of subverting the taboo that is, uh, you know, present a little bit, I would say, in, in Europe and in Italy, where, you know, funds don't, don't share as much as they were doing. And that's great because uh, reading the, the sort of the statement that they released, the idea is really to uh, make uh, sort of the matchmaking process between funders and uh, VC like as quick as possible so people can research really deeply on what a VC firm is doing and founders can really understand whether it's a good fit or it's not a good fit. So just cutting uh, sort of time and making it more efficient and, uh, you know, providing more context to whoever is interested. Also for future investments, I would say LPs, uh, they would look into like their portfolio immediately without like a loss of time uh, or energy. So that's, uh, that's pretty unique. That's pretty unique. And I think it's, uh, it's appreciated. It's a call for all the funds to kind of, uh, you know, hey, let's see what's in your book. Let's see how, how you guys are doing. I mean, there is, of course, no performance metrics, but which makes perfect sense. These are like, uh, you know, uh, proprietary information and you, want, you don't want to disclose it yet. But uh, in terms of like uh, whatever is relevant for new founders to actually interact with the firm, uh, everything is uh, laid out really out there. So that's very, very interesting. So I'm curious, uh, Nick, what is uh, what was your reaction to that? I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a new challenge. Uh, the market because as, as you said nobody publishes uh, this type of um, detailed information around their current activities not even in the US um, in the US we know about the performance the aggregate performance of funds just because the LPs publish um, that information to uh, the market or whatever uh, think about calpers they publish specific funds um, uh, activities uh, because they have, they have this history of publishing that information, but we know nothing about specific or single single deals. Um, so this is a very bold move. Um, it might be a precedent, or it might not. I don't know. Um, and really, his position is a, in a very specific way. Uh, this this can make sense. Uh, and I think others would follow in different uh, ways of approaches. Um, still, this is a primer in a uh, in market that's usually been very, very, very silent around specific KPIs. Uh, I'm curious about what's going to happen. Even though, even though, I mean, I'm not sure 100% that's full, um, full positive in any potential okay. state of the world. Um, just think being a fund, it depends on what's the fund. So I think I'd, I'd, I'd write an essay on this because I've got some thoughts, but they're, they're not in, a, in an order way in my, in my mind. But think you are a founder of a startup and one of your investors is a uh, extreme transparency uh, fund. FA is a full follower, so just a cheap investor, not leading rounds. In any information that they publish is okay. Imagine that you have, you know, a, a full transparent fund operator is a lead investor, high commitment, small portfolio investor, and they decide to write you off. 
you are still in business. You are running your business, but you know this full transpa- extreme transparency fun writes you, writes you off. What happens now? So I mean, there are so tough things. The states of the world where uh, I'm not 100% sure that full transparency is a service to the entire ecosystem. So um, I, I don't know. That's don't interesting. Know. Yeah, I don't think clear. So maybe in my mind, but I would like to 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 you know, break down a few points. Yeah, I mean, no, I get it. Like uh, checking uh, the dashboard, uh, what uh, Stefan and Unruly was were basically saying is that uh, they're basically writing check to cover about two percent of equity. So as you mentioned, is maybe that's a model that that has a very very positive impact for like uh, you know smaller funds are writing like smaller check and not necessarily leading. Uh, because then, uh, for bigger position, that can be, can can potentially become like a like a PR problem. Even like uh, when it comes, as you say, like the write off. What is the reaction of the market uh, if uh, you know it's announced that you know there there has been a write off? So that's a, that's a powerful or just a simple write down. Well, how you're yeah, negotiating yeah, for yeah. an M and A deal and your your key investor writes you down? I mean, so. No, that's yes. True. That's true. Yes, I totally. I'm totally open to this type of conversation and thinking about opening up the, the KPIs in the market. Um, I think it's helpful uh, for founders, for LPs, for a lot of players. Even though LPs have this information, <laughs> so I, I'll write a post yeah, with yeah. more of the. Uh, I was not ready to discuss it in a real life, but um, I, I would just say that. Uh, it is shining, but it's not all gold. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. let's let's put some thought into it. That's good. That's good. Good insight. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's start our AI corner with the two very interesting news, uh, starting from uh, Prem AI, Switzerland-based AI startup, raising 14 million in a seed round, featuring several high-profile business angel and entrepreneurs. So uh, what is it? I think there are like three different things that are interesting, uh, Nick, and then I am curious what, uh, what you think about that. So first of all, from, um, from their website, you can definitely see that uh, they're very much supporter of the idea of a sovereign AI. So essentially for the listener, they, you know, sovereign AI just mean, you know, AI that has been, um, that has rules and the government is taking part in actually uh, providing some regular rules to these like uh, both uh, like model development and uh, uh, deployment of AI. So this is not just, uh, you know, a free training of, uh, of AI. And these guys are really like focused on that element. Um, the second interesting element is that um, they are also pushing the idea of small language models. So when everybody is pushing the large language models, their idea is really to, okay, we can be an alternative to ChatGPT and all these like big guys by focusing on very, you know, targeted um, uh, use case and development. So that's, uh, that's an interesting element. And um, finally, what I was uh, I was checking it was the idea that um, essentially they're focusing on RAG very very much. So on um, basically a way of developing AI models called retrieval augmented generation, which by the way, like ChatGPT is not a RAG model. And then Nick, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and the idea is really to essentially. Um, give more weight, not only you know, on pre-trained information that are already kind of, let, let me say in a wrong way, embedded into the model, but they basically, with through RAG, you can actually search different data sets and database. So with the you know, pros and cons to that, and then essentially the retrievals come, come from that, uh, those elements. So uh, taking a, what these three elements kind of give them like a very specific stance on how to develop models and how the application might work so i thought that's uh, that's definitely something something interesting and we were talking about uh, uh, months ago actually well if not years when we were discussing how ai can take actually like very you know narrow like millions of narrow focused uh, language models which have like a very very specific uh, use cases so uh, what's your take on this one well um I really like what they're doing. Uh, so the product is interesting. I mean, it's not, 
it is nothing that you haven't seen anywhere else. So it's a, to, to my understanding is a you know a, a mix and match of a few features, um, putting together um, an AI ops platform with a more control and easier access to uh, implementing AI within your business, uh, basically. So it's LangChain plus LangSmith plus the capabilities of a standard a, a, API as as OpenAI all put together into a full product that allows you to better work and integrate AI into your products and workflows. So um, it's a matter of streamlining the coupling, uh, the specific AI provider for whatever you want to, 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 to use and your needs around AI in a, in a platform that give you, gives you the key, the keys. So, I mean, uh, you control what you're doing with, uh, with your, your data in particular. That's the, the core problem with data sovereignty in particular. So where is that data? Who is in control of that data? Uh, even though in the US, they might not care. In the, in the EU, uh, that's extremely important. So um, this, this is a very interesting approach from this point of view. Again, it's probably nothing that you can't reach with you know a different mix of approaches, hugging, uh, hugging face with long chain with some tooling here and there, but still um, simplifying access to this type of you know, aggregate type of services might have legs in the current market. So very interesting. Awesome. All right, um, let's close down with uh, some uh, language model trying to speak uh, Italian, purely Italian, I would say. So iGenius introduced Italia, its first open foundational Italian LM LLM. So um, essentially iGenius is focusing on uh, building a generative AI solution for businesses in conjunction with uh, Cineca, which is a consortium of Italian universities, and through the support of Leonardo, uh, and where basically they're employing their supercomputer capabilities, they came up with the Italian 9B, which is a foundational LLM with 9 billion parameter, uh, transformer architecture, like ChatGPT style. And uh, the interesting part is that uh, it's been trained exclusively in Italian. And the idea is that, uh, you know, from language to culture to language nuance, uh, that would perform way better than any large language model that have been like trained on a different bunch of uh, multi-language data. So interesting take, uh, unique, uh, definitely relevant for us. Uh, what is your reaction to this one? My reaction is, oh, let's wait and see. So. Uh... Mixed feelings uh, on my side. Uh, so I, th I think it was only a, a matter of time before we had the, the sovereign uh, LLM to, to continue with our, our conversation about sovereignty. Uh, so this is about language, um, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, even though um, uh, we need some some somehow in the global world, so. Um, this approach is interesting, but I, I really want to see what's next. So where do they want to go from here? So even if they build bigger models with more advanced capabilities, they still focus on, on the Italian language. What's the, what's the market there? Um, what can you really achieve with this approach? Uh, and I'm curious on whether this is just, you know, some, um, some way to, to, to learn how to build a foundational, foundational model, staying far away from the international community that will you know, start looking at you and looking for all the problems and flags. So keeping, keeping away from the main players and from the international commentators, you learn how to build and launch an LLM and then you start um, competing on the international field. That's, that might be potential approach to being an international player to, to, to this market. Of course, I'm really happy that we or, don't have a foundation on the land built in Italy. So this is the first. So uh, really looking forward to, 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 to how the strategy evolves uh, going forward. 
Yeah, uh, on the flip side, uh, maybe they're trying to do at scale also, or maybe that's an opportunity to actually provide uh, like a foundational layer that works really well with, for, you know, being a base for the next generation of Italian based and focused uh, uh, AI application uh, on top of which people can build. So maybe that's, uh, that's also like an angle. I mean, not an international angle, as you were saying, like trying to expand, but really keeping within the boundaries on the nation and uh, you know, solving very, very local problems. That's, uh, that's another, another aspect. I don't know how though, as you say, uh, international models that have like uh, way more you know, data point and computation and um, like huge training will compete with the specific Italian one. But, um, but yeah, definitely a, not an easy angle. I mean, building foundational models, as we were mentioning, is probably the worst idea in a certain sense, <laughs> because uh, you are really, yeah, you're really like fighting with giants. I think that the best, that the best thing that we can wait for is benchmarks. So see, mm -hmm. because it's only a matter of time. I haven't read the news. Maybe someone is already working on benchmarking um, the traditional LLMs, so the main, the mainstream LLMs, uh, either vanilla. Uh, fine tune an Italian mod language against Italia and see how it performs across the different um, the different KPIs of the of the benchmark. So that that will be one 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 initial approach to understand where you have some edge on adopting that uh, this this type of models. Yeah, you see, it's awesome. a matter of time. Yeah, I mean, people are already doing benchmark across like the huge models, but they agree the problem is uh, is to see like how exactly they're gonna compare with the with the Italian trained one. I don't know if there is anything in other languages that actually is uh, outperforming, like a French or a German based LLM. That would be interesting to see uh, if there is like some history of other languages being. Uh, you know, outperforming like gener generic vanilla model. But uh, I agree with you. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of like trying the right KPIs and see the, the applications. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for joining. This concludes this week's episode of the Week in Italian Startup. So I, we hope you find you found this episode insightful and I'll see you all next week. Ciao, Jack. Thank you so much. Ciao, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs>